Hello and welcome to the first panel of the day, Slice of Life or Cradle to Grave. I know that we all would have rather have been in person today, um, but being far flung does allow all of us to attend. I'm doing so from Rhinebeck, New York, um, from my daughter's bedroom, so that explains the poo there. Uh, and this is because of the great efforts of the bio team, um, and in particular for this event, Michael Gately and Ann Heller, and today Steve Paul, and Ann Heller in particular um, for putting this together. I am joined today by just one other panelist. We might, we might have some more visitors, but Ted Widmer, who is the author of Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington Widmore. I asked him how to pronounce it, and then I did incorrect. That's okay. So welcome today. Um, I didn't propose this panel, I should say, but I understood the concept immediately because I have written three books. I'm going to talk, I guess, a little bit more about myself since it's just the two of us rather than just being a moderator. Um, well, really two and a half books. I shouldn't call the third one done while I'm midway through it. But one has been a full biography and one and a half has been a slice of life. Um, all of my books have been informed by this topic because I experienced the slice of life out of choice. That's what I'm working on now. And the first slice of life, Alice and Frida Forever, A Murder in Memphis was out of necessity. There just simply weren't enough resources. There wasn't enough in the archives. Um, and with Washington, it felt like a necessity. My Washington biography that came out in 2020, it felt as if there was no other choice. It had to be a life told in full. And so now that I've said I understood the panel completely, Ted, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. I'm going to contradict myself and ask you, you know, is it ever really a slice of life, right? Because when I think about slices of life, when I think about Alice and Freed, I told all I could, but if there is more available, I'm thinking about like Erica Dunbar's um, The Washingtons, we often get a full biography in either a slice of life or what I often call microbiographies. Do you, how do you feel about that? Well, for me, the slice of life was the only option really. Um, Lincoln is so intimidating and so famous. I think he's probably the person about whom, let's just say the, the American about whom more biographies have been written than any other. Um, you often hear the number 16,000. I, I don't even know how we would count it actually, but um, no way I was going to write a full life of Abraham Lincoln. So it was only going to be a slice of life. And I don't even really remember a conscious decision. I just got started on this project about a train trip. It started as a newspaper article and then a series of articles about every day of the trip. And then suddenly I felt like I had a, a book growing I, I really enjoyed it, but I always knew it was only going to be those 13 days. So, you know, maybe in, in the future, later in, in my life, I might try Cradle to Grave, um, but I, I don't think so. I really like the slice of life. I, I enjoyed this one a lot. It, it was a, a new kind of a book for me and I just loved it. I, I And I have never loved any of the books I wrote before this one, but this one was really fun. And the, the, the brevity of the time was manageable. I knew I had 13 days to get through. It really helped me to have an end to know that, I, I mean, it was like a, a final day. And also because it's a train trip, I, he's got to get to Washington. He's either going to make it or he won't. And he, he did. And so I, that really helped me to have an ending. There is such a loss in, you know, I'm, Having worked in, in a lot of different time periods, I feel so fortunate right now, I'm working on a book about Kennedy to have photographs and moving images. But when things, you know, and that's still, we're still talking about, you know, the 20th century and I'm going from 1917 up until the fifties, but things are starting to move fast. But when they move slow, you can see it. There is a lot more detail. Do you think that's true that that's possible with someone like you know, Lincoln or Washington who had to take a really long trip to get to the inauguration versus, you know, someone who just takes a, a red eye or, you know. Yes, I mean, it's, it's funny you mentioned 
film just now with Kennedy um, because I had a feeling in a way that I was watching a film about Lincoln, even though there was no film in, in, in his lifetime, but I found so many accounts of, you know, he's on a train every day. And so the, you know exactly where he is minute by minute as he comes from Illinois through Indiana, Ohio, um, briefly into Pittsburgh and then upstate New York and then down toward Washington. I found a lot of local accounts in local newspapers about what he looked like at 1103 on a Tuesday. And then at 1224, he's a few towns over. And so by assembling all of those accounts together, I felt like I was almost watching a, a movie of him. And, and the moving part was, was important to me because Lincoln is usually sort of static. You know, we, we think of him sitting for a photograph. Um, that's how most of us visualize Abraham Lincoln or the statue in the Lincoln Memorial, but you know, they're very still. And I like the idea of this guy moving pretty fast ac across the landscape. Oops, I, I can't hear you, Alexis. Because I muted myself. Like oh, I'm okay. <laughs> um, lots of details too. There's a lot of time to write letters and diary entries during 13 days, you know, on the rail. Um, so that's all the, and we have a third panelist with us. We are joined by Ben Moser, who wrote um, Sontag, Her Life and Work. Welcome, Ben. Hi. Hey, ben. Hi, thank you. Sorry I was late. Hi, everyone. Okay, it's great. You are coming in right at the beginning. And so um, okay. you answer the question that, that, but you won't know what, how Ted answered. So um, he, we talked about how slice of life is, it really made sense to me. It's affected every book that I've written. Um, but at the same time, it's never really a slice of life. You know, you always have right. to incorporate some sort of biography and you end up really telling just a succinct version you you wrote an 800 page biography so you you included everything so I guess it might be the opposite or not yeah. every, and that's the thing it might be the opposite question for you is you know did you feel um are there little slices of life within this that you would like to pursue or do you feel like for you it's it's the whole life it has to be told in full it's never the whole life. I think that it might even be a false distinction to say that there's a distinction. I mean, I'm very aware, of course, I apologize in advance to everyone for writing such a long book about Sontag, but I mean, she, you know, she did a lot of stuff and I mean, so did Abraham Lincoln, obviously, but um, there's a lot that you can say about anybody. And there's even if you just think about it, maybe in terms of your day today, like what have you done today? You could tell that in a hundred different ways. You could tell it long, you could tell it short, you could tell it with reference to your great grandmother's trek across the Great Plains. I mean, you can do it in any way you want. And I think that any desire to be complete is really boring mostly for readers. I mean, I think if you think about Lincoln, I was just listening to you speaking, uh, Ted. Um, there's, you know, those 19th century biographies that like existed in my grandparents' houses. You know, you have 12 volumes about George Washington or about um, Abraham Lincoln and people actually read them. Um, and that was really a thing that, um, and now I find, I just think people wouldn't read it. And I think that even those are always incomplete. So I think what I try to do, you know, since we're talking among biographers about the craft or art of biography, is really don't try to be complete and just try to follow a few lines. Um, I think that you can structure it in any kind of way you want. I mean, I just read an interesting book about Dostoevsky writing uh, Crime and Punishment by Kevin Birmingham, which I really liked. I don't know if anyone's come across it, but you know, this is about Dostoevsky writing one book. So it's an important book, just you know, like all these, you don't choose a moment of total you know, boringness and non-importance. But you know, this book, I think Birmingham gets a lot in there. Uh, and I think that what you're really trying to do, at least what I try to do with the two biographies I've written of Clarissa Spector and of Susan Sontag is I try to get people interested. You know, I want people, I don't want to bore people. I don't want, I want it to be, you know, sort of, I don't know if sexy is the word, that's kind of a cheesy word, but you know, I want it to be, I want it to intrigue people and to lead to their, going on themselves rather than my just 
blathering for years and years um, until no one's interested at all and has no desire to go back to these works. I think I think that connects to what Ted said about, and I, I've experienced this with Kennedy. There are, you know, everyone says 16,000 for some reason. That's the number they give Kennedy to. How many books do we need on a person? And at the same time, sure, many of those books are just repeating what others have said. Um, but every generation needs a new needs new storytellers because yeah. different approaches and different interests. We're going to find different materials. There's still so much to go through, and of course, we all live in hope that there will be, um, you know, a trunk in an attic somewhere, and and we'll all have to just review all of our works and write them over. Um, I want to continue with the conversation, but I want to uh, tell our, all of our attendees that you can drop questions in the chat at any time and I will incorporate them. I'm also, um, you know, we can also get to them at the end and leave about 15 minutes. So feel free as they come to you to put them in. Um, so I next wanted to ask about something I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to pick up on something that Ted said and then return to my questions because I thought it was so interesting. He said he really enjoyed writing this book. And that is not something you often hear from people. I wonder if he means he enjoyed it the whole time or it's sort of like a memory. You know, the last part was great. The foundation, of course, was awful. The last part was great. And you just, it's, um, it's like Daniel Conahan's theory uh, that you only remember the end. If the end is good, everything else will be good. Um, so I wonder, you know, tell us, tell us, give us some insight into how you enjoy writing a biography. And um, Ben, I wonder if you agree. By the way, I want I, to say, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ben. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I did enjoy writing this book, but this is interesting. I mean, I'm curious to hear from Ted about it as well, but like, when you write about people who are, I mean, Susan Sontag's not alive, obviously, but a lot of her friends are alive. And a lot of the people who knew her or who wrote about her, or who didn't write about her and didn't like her, you know, um, those people are still around and they're really interesting people. So I got to do a lot of traveling. You know, I got to meet a lot of people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. Um, I got to read a million books I wouldn't have read otherwise. Um, there's this list that I recommend everyone if, you know, if there's another pandemic, um, there's a list of Susan Sontag's favorite 50 films uh, in the New Yorker. You can just Google Susan Sontag's favorite 50 film. And I watched all those films. And, you know, that's the work of biography that's really, uh, I feel like I'm getting another 12 PhDs or something. And, and then the writing is really fun. Um, the unfun part about biography, I would say, which I think anybody who deals with recently deceased people knows about, um, is that it's a minefield, you know, I mean, in my case, there was a kind of conflict divorce between Annie Leibovitz, Susan's last partner and her son. Um, and they really just did not like each other and their friends didn't like each other's friends. And it was, you know, as a biographer, you're often, even if you're really committed to being objective and to letting everybody have their, uh, their say, it's very uh, dangerous, actually. It's even dangerous for you as a writer to get involved in all that because you often get used as a you know, way of um, you know, airing grievances for people and, and letting people get back at each other. And um, so I don't really love that part, but I love writing biographies. I just wish they didn't take so long. You know? I wish it didn't take so long or, you know, we had so much more time to write it. I think it's really, I, I think yeah. about the Someone says, you know, I, I took 15 years to write the biography. I think, my God, but what a yeah. luck. Um, so Todd, I wonder, you know, you said that you liked writing it. Do you, do you agree with what, um, with what we've heard so far? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right to pull out that statement. I, I didn't plan it, it just came out, but it, it's true. I had done three or four academic books that were just like difficult assignments relating to an academic career. I tried to do the best I could, but they weren't that thrilling to me. And if they're thrilling, if they're not thrilling to the author, they're really not gonna be thrilling to the, to the reader. And then uh, this Lincoln project just sort of fell in my lap. It was something I had kind of on the back burner and it was just so interesting. I kept coming back to it and then I'd start sort of reading about what railroads 
what was the experience of being on a railroad like in 1861? And then I, I was sort of lucky that the train had a lot of zigs and zags and it went you know, all on this crazy route that was not at all direct to Washington. And then I got fascinated by all of the different cities and all of the different states he went through. And it became almost like a Jack Kerouac experience of, of seeing America through out, out the, a train window. And so there were just all these ways it got richer for me. And it was not like a, an academic assignment. It was something that really took me on a literal journey. I mean, I felt like I could see America through Lincoln's eyes and America was seeing him and the drama. I mean, there, I, I had not ever thought about drama in anything I did. I think academics are actually afraid of drama. And there, there was a talk, a, a really interesting panel yesterday on adding suspense, but Lincoln is in danger, very serious danger uh, from a lot of different possible assassins. Uh, and they're all concentrated in the last day of the trip as he gets closer to DC. So there's this incredible drama of the man who's probably our greatest president, not trying to say anything too harsh about JFK, Alexis, but he almost will not make it. I mean, it's very difficult for him to even arrive in Washington and become his, become the president at all. So I kept discovering how, how serious those threats were. And so I had a personal sense of drama that really made it a great pleasure. I, like I couldn't wait to do the research to figure out what was gonna happen. That's it. And when you can go at a deeper level, I'll start with Ted and then we'll go to Ben and sort of move out. Um, when you are focusing on these 13 days and you're getting to know people in a different way, um, do you think that you can sense, as you said, uh, the drama more, the, and how do you deal with the anticipation of an event like an assassination that you know is coming? And at the same time, Ben, you know, how do you sort of keep that momentum up? Um, so let's start with Ted. Well, I also wanna say, I just love that I'm on a panel about Abraham Lincoln and Susan Sontag. It's, it's so great. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I had, everyone knows that Lincoln becomes president. So one thing that was a challenge for me as a, as a writer of this book was to suspend disbelief and, or, you know, to create a sense that he might not make it. And for me, the best sources were, um, there, the, there were sources that I could quote from verbatim. Uh, there were detectives who were hired at the last possible minute to infiltrate the, the assassins who were mainly in Baltimore. And they wrote uh, accounts of what they were hearing in the bar rooms. And I could just write verbatim what, what was come, you know, what they were writing down and create more of a sense that we didn't know the future, that even though, I mean, some part of our brain knows that Lincoln will make it to Washington and give the first inaugural address. I, I by going into those detectives journals, I, I felt like I, I create, created more suspense than I, I first understood I, I, I could. And there were other things too that later, became, I was really glad that I included, but there is a storming of the Capitol by a mob during the counting of the electoral votes in February, 1861. Lincoln is on his way, he's in Ohio. He's not there yet, but a mob tried to storm the Capitol and disrupt the counting of the vote. So nobody, I, I never knew January 6th was coming, but in certain ways, the book had an eerie parallel to some contemporaneous events. Um, am I up? <laughs> yeah, um, sorry. Um, I, I think the question of suspense is really interesting because of course with a biography, unless it's somebody who's still around, you know how it ends, right? I mean, no matter what, uh, you can go on Wikipedia and you can see that Abraham Lincoln was becomes president. Um, in in my two biographies, I think the suspense that came out of it for me was kind of trying. It, it relates to what do you leave in, what do you leave out. Um, I, it was all about trying to keep people interested and keep myself interested, you know, because it's many years of working on something, and you have to keep it pretty close to the bone, I think, and not get distracted by the kinds of things that Ted was mentioning, you know. I think we all, or at least most people who, um, who write these kind of books, you know, we all went to college. We all, a lot of us went to grad school. There's a certain way that you're taught as an academic uh, person to write. Um, 
that a lot. It's, it's a kind of, you have to discard that a lot to try to keep it dramatic and to keep people reading and to keep people interested and to keep yourself interested. So for example, everybody knows that Susan Sontag dies, right? I mean, this is something that is pretty much not a secret. And um, how do you make this, how do you tell this story that has this- What's wrong, Hannah? What's uh, wrong? Can people, can people hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, um, so how do you make that dramatic? And I think it's just like any other way of storytelling. You know, you, you try to select the things that are that are the most um, that are the most compelling, whether it's detectives or whether it's you know the report from the radiologist or whatever. Um, and so you you want to select for things that are actually interesting emotionally. I think you brought brought up something really interesting, and you know I'm moderating, and so I have the power to see who's coming into the room and who's not. And of course, there are so many amazing biographers here, and many who I've read write or talk about biographies. Some of them have written, you know, books on biography. I see uh, Nigel Hamilton here, and so that that makes me wonder, you know, does the scope of um, of this project as you as you decide that you know I'm going to write a full biography, I'm going to write a microhistory, a slice of life, you know, does that um, influence your choices about structure and chronology? Ben, you, you mentioned breaking rules, that you saw this really clearly. So you're just skipping the rules, you know, you have a vision. I have felt both ways. Um, so how how does it allow freedom and also you know, how does it restrict you? Both, both, whoever wants to take it first. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to give a, give a first stab at that. Um, I, I had a better structure with this project than I've ever had. So in my academic books before this one, which, you know, I, I don't mean to put them down too much, but I, 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 I guess I have to because I'm trying to make a point why this one was was better. I would have a lot of different ideas that I was trying to get out and they weren't really clearly demarcated by chapters. And because this book was literally day by day, a, a day is a chapter. So there were 13 days of this train journey and each one is a chapter. And I had a chapter before it began and a chapter ap after. I just was so relieved to have that clear structure. Um, I did add a little bit, I mean, this is going back to your first question, Alexis. I did sneak in a little cradle to grave material, even though it's a slice of life book. I tried to open with, um, you know, who is Abraham Lincoln? He's a very strange person in, in many ways. So I, I tried to establish Lincoln. And then I, I actually wrote an epilogue. I think I called it an epilogue, but it was sort of like an odd extra bit of writing that wasn't really an epilogue. And, and it's about something that happens at near the end of his life when he goes to Richmond, Virginia in the final days of the Confederacy and has an incident. He, he gets out off a boat and the city is on fire I and mean, it's very dangerous. And there are some uh, slaves at the riverbank and he like just clamors out of the boat and they all start crowding around him and they figure out who he is. It's sort of very interesting. How do they know this is Abraham? But they, they know. And he gives a beautiful speech that is not in his official compilation of the speeches of Abraham Lincoln, which is a, a record we know very well. So it's a sort of extra speech. It was so interesting to me. And he talks about freedom and how they have become free now. And it was just such a dramatic moment that I snuck it in, even though it's not part of the 13 days of the, the train trip. So I did allow a little bit of breaking of my own rules just for dramatic effect. Yeah, and if I can pick up on that, I think it is nice when you have the structure that a biography gives you. You know, the person is born and grows up and writes some books or becomes president and then dies. Okay, so that's pretty much there. The thing is, I mean, you can make that a historical novel. You know, you can make that a poem. You can make that really anything. And I think that what... Um, a biography is a narrative, and that's something that people um, often forget in the in the haze of details because you really do get um, completely snowed under with details. You know, I mean, how many? You know, you're not going to read the sixteen thousand books about Abe Lincoln or about JFK or you know, I mean, Susan didn't get as many, but you know, people there's some ink has been spilled on the subject, 
And um, I think ultimately it comes down to what your sensibility is. What are you writing about and what do you find compelling? So if Ted, like if you find that speech and you want to include it, you know, why the hell not include it? It's a great speech. I mean, I didn't know about it. I don't know everything about it. And, but, you know, I mean, I would like to read that. I'd be totally fascinated by that. And if you find yourself going into areas that you either don't feel comfortable with, uh, you know, uh, in terms of your own knowledge or your own experience, you can skip them. I mean, I think there really aren't that many rules. I mean, in my book about Sontag, um, for example, you know, I'm gay. So I'm interested in the history of gay rights. And I'm interested in the history of, um, you know, how gay people lived in the generations before me. Um, in my previous book, you know, I'm also Jewish. And um, I'm interested in Clarice Lispector's experience of Judaism and anti-Semitism, um, probably more than other people might be who aren't Jewish. You know, they might not think it was that interesting or that important. And, you know, maybe it's not. I think the thing is that um, if you just remember, I mean, I don't know if we're giving advice. I know there are a lot of people here who probably don't need to hear from me about any of this. But, like, you know, I think what's good is to stay close to your own interests and your own sense of what's compelling about this person and why you're doing this book. And I think if you do that, um, it does help clarify where you should be going with it. Um, and there's not really a law. You know, if you, if you want to put in a Lincoln speech, who the hell cares? It's great. Do it. You know? And it's yeah. nice, even if you go outside of the scope, I, some of Lincoln's lesser known speeches are really exciting. My favorite is, you know, not for score and seven years ago. It's, uh, during right before the Mexican American war, when he's like a young upstart on the right. floor yelling against it. It's, it's wonderful. Um, yeah. so it seems to me that both approaches, even though I know Ted, you've sort of answered this, but both approaches allow you to return to a subject in a different way. And mm. uh, this is not, again, I'm going off topic here. This wasn't, well, I'm going off my script. This wasn't something I thought, but David Nassau uh, entered the room and he wrote a wonderful book on Kennedy called The Patriot. And I recently, well, I've read three books in recent, uh, in the last year on Joseph P. Kennedy's ambassadorial disaster. And whenever I've read those books, I've always come back to the patriarch and I've thought, oh, this is so great. I, I just wish that, that David would write a second book. Um, and so I wonder, you know, Ted, do you feel like you can return to Lincoln or this time period and write a whole bio or focus on a, a specific period? You brought up the stress of, you know, knowing the threats around Lincoln, which I think were really pronounced in a way that people don't totally understand until they read a book like, like yours that can really focus on that time period. You know, so I could see being inspired to write, you know, uh, a small slice of life or a biography on, you know, Mary Lincoln and, and talk about how this stress sort of impacted her. Um, and Benjamin, you know, you wrote a full bio, but you talked about how you can't really explore every incident and you have to leave, you have to just briefly touch on them, you have to leave some by the way sign. Um, so is there, you know, a part of Susan Sontag's life that you could see expanding on? So Ted, would you, would you gain to return? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I put nine years of my life into this book and reading just about everything by Lincoln, by or about Lincoln, I, I could. So it seems kind of foolish not to keep working on him. It's like I put down the down payment on the car. Why don't I drive it a few more years? But um, I don't think I am going to do more Lincoln. I, I might do book reviews of books about Lincoln. I just did one uh, about a month ago. But I'm sort of drawn to some other things. I have some 20th century topics I'm, I'm playing around with. And if I were to do something in the Civil War, I, I'm thinking a little bit about actually Lincoln's nemesis, Jefferson Davis. I'm, I'm, I don't like Jefferson Davis. I do like Lincoln, but I'm feeling kind of drawn to some stories about Jefferson Davis I've been reading lately. So I think I'm... I'm trying to listen to the left brain, not the right brain. The right brain would just make a rational calculation. Like you're in the Lincoln world, stay with it. But I'm, I'm interested in unusual stories. Yeah, I, I sympathize with that a lot. I mean, I think that it's very easy. Um, this is also something, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but maybe because Ted brought it up about academic writing and writing of this kind. Um, 
you know, academic writing encourages you to specialize in a smaller area of things. And Sontag said that a writer is someone who's interested in everything. And I think when you, you know, we've written a book, it might naturally lead in one direction. I mean, I could, Sontag wrote about so many different things. So I mentioned gay rights or you know, say the Vietnam War or, or feminism or all these other topics that come up in the course of a book about Susan Sontag. You could take, you could take it in a different direction, not, not even mention her, but it would still be kind of related. I mean, you know, Jefferson Davis is more related to Lincoln, but, but you could also, I think one of the great things about biographies is they are really broad and they do expose you to a lot of stuff and a lot of people and a lot of books that you might not have encountered otherwise. And sometimes that curiosity just kind of takes you over. And I think it's important to let it take you over and not kind of be determined to squeeze every drop out of the lemon, you know, because that, I think readers can tell, and I think it's, I think you can tell. And I think, you know, if you've written, how long did you work on your book, Ted? Uh, nine years. Okay, well, so that makes mine seem really quick and easy. It was only seven years. But like, <laughs> um, you know, after that time, you you do feel in a way that you've said what you want to say about it. Um, but then, I don't know, I guess they have a way of coming back and getting you in the end. <laughs> There's always something more. Do they never leave you? Um, I don't want to harp on Link, but when Anne mm. Helen wrote uh, us all an email introducing us to each other, she put the, you know, paid the, the number, the page numbers in front of you, which is interesting. Um, both, you know, so this is my slice of life book and this is my biography, you know, in between the Pooh Bears and such. Mm. And both of them are around the same length. They're both around a few hundred pages. And so I wonder if, you know, I, I again was um, inspired and influenced by the availability of resources, you know, what was available in the archive and also simply instinctually what I thought needed to be told and how it needed to be told and for what audience. It didn't really affect the telling for me how long the book should be, no matter how much time I'm supposed to cover. Do you feel that way? Or do you feel like when you got to 800, did you have that? That is a, a common number for biographies. So I wonder if the 800 pages is where publishers tell you, all right, we're, we have to stop there else this is two volumes and they hate two volumes. Or is this, you know, is it the same way? Do you just feel like I do what I need to do? I'm, I'm thinking that one is aimed at me as the longest <laughs> fucking yeah. book ever. Yeah. But I mean, I didn't really mean it to be that long. I didn't. It wasn't like I thought, nobody told me, no, it has to be shorter or it has to be longer. Or I think that, um, I think there's a lot more, I almost want to say sensuality involved in these things. Like you kind of feel it. You know, you do feel like I actually do need another chapter on this subject. I, you know, I can't write a book about Sontag without another chapter on X, Y, or Z. Um, and so it's sort of, it's, it's very, for me, at least, I feel it. I feel where I need more and where I need less. And then uh, once you have a draft, you know, that's when you can go back and you read it. And again, I feel it pretty physically almost when I'm going on too long. Like when this chapter, I thought it was so urgent. I thought it was, I couldn't live without it. Well, actually, it's boring and cut it, you know, and that sometimes happens too. But I think that... Um, I'm not a fan, I'm not an advocate of writing really long books. Um, I don't know, I, I feel like um, I've become this like spokes model for like endless biographies, which like <laughs> was not my intention. But like, I think that you can do it in, in any different way that really feels right again. And um, so if you think, you know, you can do Lincoln in 200 pages. You can do Lincoln in a thousand words. Or you can do it in 12 volumes. I mean, it just really depends on what, you, what you're what you doing. I'm glad to hear you say that, Ben, because I feel like I've been known as the short biography person. So we can book. Okay, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell yeah, me because this is all about you get stuck in these kind of yeah. labels that people put on you. I think, yes. And I think, we, you know, it could be a choice that you make for, for each book. It could be a part of a, a larger project. I tend to think that you know, shorter chapters are better and particularly for the sort of reader I'm, I'm interested in getting, but it is, it is interesting and also um, shedding the vestiges of the past when certain people expect a length or a type of book from you. But Ted, I'm, I wonder what you have to say about this. Well, I sort of want to just say something about my editor because that was, she was the final 
arbiter of how long this book was. It, left to my own devices, it, I would have written a much longer, I would have joined you, Ben, in, in the, the length mm. department. And um, I had a long beginning that we cut. And then in each chapter, I had a lot of material on the history of each city that he was going through, which I found fascinating. And she made me cut her, this was the late Alice Mayhew, who was a legendary editor in New York and edited a lot of Lincoln books. So she knew Lincoln very well. <clears throat> and it was very frustrating to me because I'd excavated all that information. I didn't want to cut it, but she, she was a tough old battle ax and she held all the cards and she said, she wouldn't even tell me what to cut. She said, you must cut 20,000 words. And she didn't say which 20,000. It, it was very frustrating, but I went and did it. And then after I did that, she said, now 5,000 more. And that too, I was like, couldn't you just tell me to cut 25,000 the first time? But somehow we got to a leaner narrative and I'm so happy a couple of years after the fact that she she made me do it. So I don't think I could have edited myself. I, I'm incapable of it, but I had a, a really gifted editor. I want to encourage everyone to, uh, I see sorry. some questions, some hands raised. So I just want to encourage everyone to drop their questions in the chat, um, just because so many people have been doing that from the beginning. So I want to give everyone's questions time. Um, and I'm going to shift now to questions from the audience. Um, this is interesting. I just read a book that, that, that um, so Elizabeth Renker asks, you know, thoughts on the biographer, including an arc of their own detective search with its twists and surprises. And I have um, come across a lot of that from the, from the 50s and 60s and 70s. And I find it interesting as a biographer and a researcher, certainly if I'm going through the same steps as they are um, and they're doing it at a very different time or it's nice to hear, oh, this isn't possible. Um, at the same time though, a lot of people find that very boring. I've read reviews of some of these books and people hate those particular points. Um, you know, oh, and then we decided this and then we realized that, or I realized that if, you know, how do you feel about that? Is that, is that for the preface? And is that, you know, or can we bring that into the whole narrative? Either one, whoever wants to jump in. You're muted, Ben. Sorry, I was gonna say, I think that's for my memoirs. You know, sometimes I think it's kind of, uh, it's often hard. I think, you know, we're talking about a question of editing. It's often hard to know what is interesting to you because your head is so far up the, you know, what of the archive <laughs> that, every fact is like oh my god susan brought like bought skim milk you know or something and you think the world's got to know this um and on the other hand um it's interesting that when you talk about you know you go out on tour you talk you get interviewed like people really find this stuff interesting um maybe even more interesting than i find it there's a real interest in archives um surprisingly you know because when i was um at Susan's archive at UCLA. Um, I went there for a few months and I, you know, I never really teach, so I enjoy teaching. And I did a little seminar about Latin American literature. And, um, and I realized actually like kind of toward the end of the semester that the kids, or I guess they were like young adults, they were like in their twenties, they were grad students. And um, they had actually never really even been into the rare books division at UCLA and they hadn't actually seen all this stuff and they were really into it and, and, and it was really fun. Um, and I wrote a piece in the New Yorker called In the Sontag Archives that was probably the most read thing I ever wrote. People really liked that idea. And if you're a historian or an academic or a researcher, you know, you kind of think you go to the archive, you fill out a form, you get the box. It doesn't seem that exciting, you know, but so, um, and then all sorts of stuff happens to you because your own life, I think that's the interesting thing is like your own life is going on as this other person's life is being reconstructed um, and they come to intersect in all these different ways. But again, you know, I would just say that like sometimes these things are well-written and germane to your book and sometimes they're not. So you have to trust your own judgment and also the judgment of your editors. And to sort of play with form in a way whenever possible, whether it's, you know, yeah. 
you know, writing about the book after, or um, my first job out of grad school was as um, a research curator in the exhibitions department of the New York Public Library. And the most popular exhibition I ever worked on was simply the centennial and it was showcasing everything in the archive and people couldn't believe what we had. And so it's sort of incredible. And I always feel like it's so unfair that readers don't get to see what we see. It's just incredible and it gives you such a great sense of life. Um, with my first book, I had an illustrator illustrate it because there were so few primary sources that what we could find that I felt were really moving, like um, you know, a receipt or a love letter or um, anything, a bag of coal, I would, I would have illustrated and see if it would, it would move people when it did, I included it. Um, Ted, what, what do you think? Well, just you, you, by mentioning how interesting archives are, you, you both just did, I, I quickly thought of an amazing exhibit that's currently at the New York Historical Society up on the second floor. And it's about the technique of Robert Caro. It's a whole exhibit of, about a historian. Usually the exhibits are about the political figures or the cultural figure, but this is really about the work of Robert Caro and they're like his pencils and his typewriters and his file cards. And it's so interesting to see his stuff. So anyone in New York might wanna go, go look at that. Um, but then, uh, you know, both in comments you made and then in the chat, I saw some interesting ideas about what to do when you have too much material. One person said she created a website and put the stuff that she couldn't put in, the extra stuff went onto a website that she created. And I think that's a really good idea. I'm also aware of, a, uh, there, there's a Lincoln biographer named Michael Burlingame who wrote a very big two volume biography of Lincoln, but then put online something even bigger for free. So if you're a Lincoln maniac, you can go read that. And I, I certainly did and enjoyed it. And um, Mark Lewis in the Beatles, the great Beatles biographer, he's writing something like it's sort of on a Robert Caro level, this huge biography of the Beatles that will, you know, I, I hope it will someday be finished. But volume one, which covers about 1958 to 62, was about 800 pages in the normal form you would buy in a bookstore. But on his own personal website, you can order a special extended edition that is twice as long. It's like 1600 pages just on the first four years. And I got it, it's fantastic, but I don't think it would survive in the marketplace. It's too big. So either you put it up for free online or you have a special edition that you sell. And, and I think that's the proper place for all the extra material. It, it, that's interesting. It connects to a question in the chat. Um, you know, Julia Mickenberg asks, you know, we follow our own interests. Uh, what are what about things we are comfortable with? So I don't necessarily feel justified in leaving out these things. Um, is it okay to leave out stuff we don't like dealing with? You know, where do we put it? Um, and also that connects to a different question, which is, um, you know, can we even do, are, are some of these methods, are they best for certain type, types of personality? Um, and I think sort of the reason I think they're connected is yes and no. I mean, we've mentioned what we do with excess, what editors cut, what we know just can't fit in. And then sometimes there is not a lot of interest in certain, certain personalities or it's not for you. And I'm thinking of um, the co-founder of The New Yorker, um, Jane Grant, there's no biography on her. There's about four mentions on the website of her. Three of them are wrong. Um, and I really became early pandemic interested in her and wrote, thought I might write a book on her. And I wrote about, you know, five, 10,000 words, decided, you know, I just really wanted to write a book about Kennedy, but I felt as if I should write a book about Jane Grant. And so I just put it online. I put it in a newsletter and I said, you know, this is, and I literally said this for the taking someone should write this book and you should write it, if anyone's listening, you should write it before the New Yorker centennial, which is coming up. So now is the time. Um, and so I, I wonder, you know, do personalities have to do with this, with the subject, the approach, you know, and, and do we, you know, and then within that, does it matter if we're really interested in them? Um, and then I think the uncomfortable, the word uncomfortable might be better for Ben, but let's start with, let's start with Ted. Um, I basically left out 
the entire presidency of Abraham Lincoln, which is the main thing most people want to think about. I just put him on a train and got him to the eve of his presidency. And I just left out the fighting of the war and all the very uncomfortable things that were happening in those four years. I, I then did sort of in my final pages refer to the assassination, but I did it extremely obliquely. I just said he goes off to Ford's theater and then didn't describe the assassination, but then talked about the train that has to take his body back. And so I really left out some very important stuff. And in the case of the presidency, it was just too overwhelming. It, I, you know, I was very relieved not to. Um, the case of the assassination, I was uncomfortable. I mean, I, this is related to some other topics over the course of the, the weekend, but do, do you like your t- subject or not? And I, I was sort of in love with my subject, which I think is a little uncomfortable to admit because I'm not as objective as I could be, but um, there is a lot to love in Lincoln in the beauty of his words and the noble tragedy of his, of his life. And so I just didn't want to describe him being killed. I just didn't want to go there. Um, also, it's you know, been extremely well documented in other, other books. Um, but I'm feeling relieved because at the beginning of this conversation, Ben basically gave us all permission to just write the books we, we want to write. So I don't feel that badly about leaving out those things I left out. Um, thank you, I'm glad. Um, I, I think if I understand Julia's question um, a little bit differently that she's asking about like things that make you uncomfortable, the things that sort of turn you off about your subject or things that, sort of mixed yeah, time. like, uh-huh. Um, well, so I think my first book, I mean, Ted, you were in love with Lincoln. I mean, I think anybody probably would be, right? I mean, he's uh, incredibly, right. it's, it's hard not to love this figure. Um, Clarissa Spector, the subject of my first book, I was completely, and I think openly, completely in love with her. I thought she was a great genius and a fabulous person. And it was very easy in that sense. Susan Sontag is um, a very conflicted and conflictual person. There was a lot of fireworks around her um, alongside all of her incredible and indubitable achievements and fabulous things that she did. Uh, she was cruel. She was um, extremely inconsiderate of other people. She was very abusive sometimes. Um, and that is part of your job as a biographer. It's not to think, oh, I'm so uncomfortable with this or whatever. I mean, that nobody really cares. Talking about like the back, you know, of course you're uncomfortable if she's like yelling at Annie Leibovitz in the middle of a restaurant and all of her, everybody in New York is just like horrified. Of course you want to be like, Susan, shut up. Like take, go to the bathroom, pick yourself up, come back out and smile. You know, like that's what you want to tell the person. You can't tell the person that because the person's dead and you don't know the person. Um, but there is a degree, I think, of you as a person are asked to do a certain amount of emotional labor, as people would now say, um, because nobody really cares if you're against spousal abuse, for example, which is something that occurs in the Sontag book. Um, what, what matters isn't you in that sense. What matters is trying to understand how people work from their own experience. So like, why does somebody who has so many advantages apparently in life as Susan Sontag does, why is she constantly unhappy in her personal relationships? Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of her, um, of her fiction. You know, people like to kind of dump on her fiction Um, They like to dump on her movies. They like to dump on some of her theater work. Um, And it's kind of, I think a lot of it's just people are intimidated by her and they want to look down on her in some way because otherwise she's smarter than they are. And that's kind of embarrassing. But like people as a writer, you know, you are trying to understand why does she do this? Like, why is she writing this play? Like, why is it important for her? Like, why does she choose this weird structure for this novel that's like kind of semi-French and semi early 60s and you know you're not it's not really about you always I mean I've talked a lot about using my own sensibility um and I do like I'm pretty open about that but on the other hand my sensibility isn't necessarily the main thing you know you're trying to understand the person from their own life from their own their own experience Uh, so I don't know if that um, 
answers the question at all. I think it does. I think it does. I, um, I just want to remind everyone as far as questions, we have 10 minutes. Um, we would prefer that you put the questions in the chat. I see some hands raised. So if you're just throw those in, that would be great. There was a question and, and people are really interested in structure and, um, you know, the nitty gritty of biography more than narrative. I mean, they're interested in narrative, but I think that makes sense given, given the venue. Um, and there was a question about authorized versus unauthorized and whether or not that affects your approach. And, and I, I like my subjects good and dead. I really do, preferably as far in the past as possible. Um, and I am, you know, now I'm working on a book about Kennedy and, and there are Kennedys around and it seems like they have less of a influence than they used to, but it used to be quite strong. Um, and so aside from, you know, so of course there's the, there's the issue of access, you know, how much will the families let us see? Um, there's another woman I've wanted to, to get to know better in Kennedy's sphere, but the family won't let anyone near it because they want to sell it. Um, and so, you know, does that play a role really? Do, does authorized versus unauthorized play a role anymore at all? Definitely. I mean, I have this, um, I, I have this longstanding misunderstanding about my authorization. You know, I did my, I was the authorized biographer for Sontag and this is something people often have said that my book is the authorized biography, which is not true. Well, what's true is that I was given access based on my previous book to basically to the Sontag archive, which is in Los Angeles. Um, and there's a public part and then there's a private part that's restricted, I think till 2060 or something. And I was kind of excited about that. I thought it was gonna be, you know, like the Vatican porn archive where the popes kept all their dirty stuff and you kind of thought this is gonna be great. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's actually often reflects the concerns or the fears of people who lived 50 years ago and you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings or something. And you don't even, you look at some of the stuff and you're like, hmm, okay. Um, but, but I did get access to it. And a lot of it was really, was really interesting, but it wasn't interesting in the way that you would think the secret archive is going to be that interesting. Um, and it definitely helps with getting permission to speak to people. And, you know, um, your, your concern, Alexis, is really interesting because sometimes people are holding out for something that's probably not very realistic or probably um, they don't even know how to go about it because there's all these procedures. Um, and then some people will talk to you if you are kind of the, the, the anointed one. Um, but what people don't tell you is that just as many people won't talk to you because of that. I mean, um, when Susan died, you know, there was this real separation between her son and her and her partner. And so the fact that her son was involved in asking me to do this book meant that the people that were around Amy Leibovitz often did not want to talk to me because they saw me as kind of tainted or kind of compromised with this other, um, this other part of the story. Um, so I think like it, like most things, it can cut both ways. And, you know, if you do good and dead, like Lincoln, um, but you know, there's always a minefield you can walk into. I mean, anything that, I mean, I'm sure like academic uh, Lincoln specialists, I'm sure they have their camps and I'm sure they have their friends and their enemies. And, and you know, that's just kind of the reality. And so I think authorization, um, it also can make your book look tainted in a certain way because when, when people hear authorized, they assume it's like, the really nice biography of Joan Crawford that makes her seem like a very philanthropic person, you know, and it's not, you try to say like, that's not it. And, and people don't always believe you. That's absolutely true. I was thinking about this part in, because I mentioned the patriarch David Nassau's book and I was thinking mm. in the beginning, he talks about the family asking him to write this book. And then he talks about his conditions. And I find that that is often right. the in what we think about as contemporary authorized biography in which right. they get it in writing, get a lawyer. That's all I can say. That is true. Little advice. Huh? Lawyers we... are your friends. Yes. Yes, very much so. Ted, what um, do you I, I I didn't have any unauthorized material because Lincoln died so long ago. Everything is in the official record. I mean I did work hard to find things that were well known. 
But, uh, and I, I think I actually did a few things that I added a little bit to what is known about Lincoln, um, but it, there was nothing unauthorized. But this is a sort of wrinkle, or, or kind of just a slightly different angle on the question. I, I am very interested in the Beatles. I've mentioned them a few times and it's funny, I have to wrestle against my academic feeling that it's not as serious as a, a political life in the 19th century in the United States, but it's just, you know, I've been a Beatles fan my whole life. And I did a portrait of Stuart Sutcliffe, who was the original bassist, who was only in the band for about a year and died. He left the band and then he died. He, he wanted to be a painter. And I really enjoyed the work. And this became an, a, a story in the New Yorker online only about a month ago. And I'm sort of toying with the idea of making a bigger, it, it would be a short book. Um, not not a long one, but I found this problem, which is that Paul McCartney, and we know we all love Paul McCartney, but he is buying up all of the archival material when it comes onto the market. So he's, he's so rich, he just buys up anything, any photograph or any letter from Hamburg. So he's actually making everything his version of the story. There's very little archival material that he doesn't own. So it's kind of a problem for me if I if I want to pursue this as a, as a topic, and I I want to tell a version of the story that is not Paul McCartney's because I think he actually cannot remember what really happened. I think he thinks he remembers it, but he he doesn't actually. And um, so how do you write the true story when one of the protagonists is buying up all the archival material? It's an interesting problem. How old is he? He's um, born about 1942, I'd say, 42, okay. so he's about 80. We have just a You can couple just wait. Yeah. A little bit of time. Um, it's always heartbreaking when you see that something will open up, you know, a year later than you know you'll be able to write. Um, unless I live to 120, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do a couple things on my list. I see a couple hands still. So if you wanna look at your profile and see if you have your hand up and if it's by accident or if you have a question, I will assume you really do. And in the meantime, there were so many people who were interested in structure and in just, you know, real, just advice. Um, and so I wanted to do a rapid fire last round. Is there any advice that you have on this entire topic? Is there something you feel like people need to know and you wish someone would have asked, including me, um, that you want to share. And we have two minutes. I, I trusted my editor made me cut that stuff. I was really I didn't want to do it. I was really glad she made me do it. So cutting is is desirable and having clear chapters that make like one point that's really clear to you. And therefore, it will be clear to the, the readers. And also, I hope we can hear Nigel Hamilton's question. I see. I see he has a hand raised. Can't hear you, Alexa. No, you can't. I think it's an accident. Um, a few of them are. So, okay. So, so, Ben, what do you? He's not going to thrill us with a question. So, Ben, what do you have to? to okay. Um, well, I would say a couple of things that have been really useful to me that people have told me just in general. First of all, um, all this stuff about the material and the amount that you have to deal with. Um, being organized. It seems boring and it is boring often just entering stuff into your database and just keeping track of stuff uh, becomes a lifeline. So whatever you can invest in organization um, becomes something that you're really glad that you have at a certain point. I mean, if you try to find a quote that you really love and you cannot think where you saw it and you can spend months looking for it. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, like try to, I think that if you write about stuff that's interesting for you, it will be interesting for the reader. And it's interesting that Ted mentioned how he cut stuff about research, I mean, about the origins or the history of the cities that, that Lincoln went through. Um, that is actually kind of painful to lose in a certain way, but I actually don't think it's really lost. I think you can cut it, but not lose it. And right. that's a distinction that you have to have that, maybe for some personal reason, you need to know about like beaver trading and Schenectady in the 16th century to tell about, you know, the day that Lincoln stops there. And it's not necessarily, I think just kind of be tolerant with yourself for following those interests and 
understand that you might get something out of them that might not be that paragraph or that page that you wanted it to be in the book, but that just might be something that's interesting for yourself. Right. And that actually does inform the page that's in the book. Right. I, I agree with that. I, I think I distilled certain ideas and told it more efficiently mm -hmm. afterwards. So I agree with that. Right. I also, I really do think that there is a place for everything, even if it, if it is, you know, you dump everything into a doc that's called, you know, things to write around the book launch, or if it's, you know, an article or something, something bigger that's, that's written 10 years later. Um, and I think that we have learned from this panel discussion that really form and structure can be thrown out the window as long as you do good work and you feel very strongly and passionately about it and maybe have a really good editor. Um, so thank you so much, Ted and Ben and everyone for coming. It was, you know, thank you. list of names and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.